robots took my podcast, man. 1045. Clint Eastwood, disguised as a guard, enters the maximum security vault at Montana Armored. 1047. Jeff Bridges, dressed as a woman, enters the central alarm office and overpowers the man on duty. 1052. George Kennedy carries a 20 millimeter cannon into the vault. 1057. Clint Eastwood loads the weapon with three armor piercing shells. 1102. The alarm system is deactivated. 1104. Clint Eastwood aims the cannon point blank at the solid steel door. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. Clint Eastwood is Thunderbolt in Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. A movie. The movie. A knockout. Rated R. Under 17, not admitted without parent. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot's very, very frightening me. Hallelujah. Gary Busey. Gary Busey's in this film. Ken Eastwood. Young Jeff Bridges. Young Jeff Bridges and he's a baby. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll kick us off, I guess. Uh, three, two, one. Welcome to our podcast. The robots took my podcast. I am Jordan. And I am Anthony. Anthony, what movie are we talking about this evening? Today, Jordan, we're talking about a good old-fashioned heist movie. And funny enough, this is, I guess, I don't know if it should be a series, but random Eastwood movies... You surprised me on a prior episode with Magnum Force, which was was a pleasant surprise. Yes. Same writer as this movie as well, Michael Cimino. Connection there. Uh, Yeah, same uh, music's by the same guy, D. Barton, who worked on a lot of other Eastwood films. And it's produced by Eastwood's uh, production company, Malpaso. Yeah, his production arm, yeah. So he was the guy behind them. He was the producer on this movie as well. The guy calling the shots also. Yeah, with his longtime producing partner, Robert Daly. So this is a Clint Eastwood movie. Not directed by him. I mean, he directed Play Misty before this, but... I feel It feels weird that I haven't actually seen this movie all the way through. I kind of did sit there a lot thinking through this movie going, where has this movie been all my life? You know, anyway. Yeah. So, like you mentioned, Michael Cimino wrote Magnum Force. So, right the year before this, actually. He wrote this screenplay on spec, apparently with Eastwood in mind, I, I read somewhere. And then apparently Eastwood, his agent pitched it as an Eastwood Jeff Bridges package, apparently, to the studio, I think it was. And that's how it apparently, and then Eastwood, of course, saw it and went, hell yeah, I want to direct it, but then decided not to direct it, and it really... And then, of course, Chimino said, I owe everything to Clint later on in his career because he that kicked his career off right there. Just the fact that Eastwood let him direct that movie and, and was behind him. Yeah, just became quite a director himself. He directed The Deer Hunter after this, big Oscar yeah. winner. So, yeah, thanks, Clint Eastwood. Apparently he was, uh, I mean, apparently too, when Chimino did Deer Hunter, that was all, that was all uh, apparently him saying, I'm not going to just take anything that comes my way. I'm going to, I'm going to write something artistic and personal. Yeah. This is um, certainly a Clint Eastwood movie, any way that you want to, any which way but loose or every which way you (laughs) can. It's a, it's a Clint Eastwood movie. And he, um, I think he did some soft directing on this. Yeah. It was Michael Chino's first thing, but I, I, Clint Eastwood's fingerprints are pretty much all over this movie. So, and it's an all-star cast, Jordan. This movie has, it's a who's who of seventies actors. And we'll get to those people as they appear in the film. I think also, apparently you, you, you bring up a good point. Eastwood behind the scenes kind of being a, another director. You're right. Apparently what I read was Eastwood wouldn't do more than three takes most of the time. And if there was at one point Jeff Bridges had to go to Chimino and go, can, can I get a fourth one? I got an idea here. And Chimino said, I got to go ask Clint. Oh, yeah. And Clint a couple of times would say, give the kid his shot. And, and most of the time, though, Clint would say, no, we have enough. Let's move on. because there, And there's the producer kicking in right there, you know. Yeah, it's his money. Yeah. yeah. And another Clint Eastwood vehicle. So, oh, absolutely. Um, this, is, this is pretty interesting because Jeff Bridges had just done a couple of years of, before this, The Last Picture Show. Right? Yeah. Big, big hit. Uh, probably one of the best movies of the 70s um, on paper. Yep. He came from an acting family. His father, Lloyd, his brother, Bo, 
uh, and they had already been acting. I mean, of course, Bo had been acting already way before Jeff, I guess. And Yeah, and Jeff Bridges needs no introduction. But for those that don't know who Jeff Bridges is, somehow, Jordan, who is Jeff Bridges? What, what did he, uh, what's he known for? Most younger people nowadays might know him as the dude from The Big Lebowski. Or yeah. from Tron Legacy and and that 80s film Tron from 1982, the groundbreaking year of 82. And, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I bet most notably people know him from these movies, I bet, nowadays. Oh, yeah. Starman? Oh, man, he's Starman, great. oh, my God, that movie, yeah. I, if anybody doesn't know the movie Starman out there, go watch it. If you want a, if you want a nice tearjerker, alien, sci-fi, warm, fuzzy John Carpenter movie directed, Karen, or, anyway. A warm, fuzzy John Carpenter movie. <laughs> John Carpenter's E.T., this movie is, basically. <laughs> All right. So how does this film begin, Jordan? It begins with a static shot. It looks kind of like a composite shot of a field, right? Just, yeah. We are in... It says Idaho, but Montana, really, right? Apparently yeah, they shot in Montana. Yeah, Big Falls, apparently. It's very, just Vista-esque looking, very picturesque. Yeah, and they use, um, filmed in Panavision, right, Jordan? Yeah, why? What's our aspect screen? ratio, aspect ratio check? 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio, Anthony. Widescreen <laughs> anamorphic process. Thank which you. started as the cinemascope process back in the 50s from 20th Century Fox Patton. I'm sorry. But yeah, it's 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 a well shot film. They use the locations a lot. I would say that the locations are pretty much a character. Definitely in this movie. beautifully shot. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So we get this beautiful shot of this film. A lot of wide shots here, which is pretty interesting. And then this old Cadillac, old fifties Cadillac, pulls up to a church, right? Right. And we see who do we see in this church as the preacher? This is Clint Eastwood with glasses, looking like Father Bishop. Uh, <laughs> this is a, that's a really deep cut reference right there for people out there. Yeah, um, it was over my head. <laughs> so, I mean, looking like looking like Bishop Pike somehow, like Clint Eastwood playing Bishop Pike is what I meant to say. I oh, gotcha. On the pulpit giving a sermon, right? Yeah, then, the most weirdest image ever, honestly. Yeah, it's so funny just knowing Clint Eastwood. It's he's selling it, I guess, but wow, he really gets to stretch in this movie. I think a little bit. Yeah. And then we see Jeff Bridges. And his googly smile, right? And he's baby, sort of... baby Jeff Bridges here, yeah. And he is like a, he's sort of this drifter, right? And he goes to this car lot and steals yeah. a, a Firebird. Yeah, he like just he test drives it right off the lot, right? Basically. Yeah, he. I mean, if you can just say <laughs> getting in a car and driving off yeah. is test driving, yes. We have to mention too his Jim Morrison looking leather pants that he's got on as well as his leather bell bottoms. He's dressed really well in this movie. Yeah, so the, the costume, the costume, he's not like some, you know, hippie drifter, he's, you know, He's uh, dressed like a pimp, like, <laughs> from that time period. Yeah. <laughs> he, he is, and it's kind of funny, because in the middle of Montana. Yeah. But anyway, so, yeah, the car salesman comes up, and the car salesman has, like, ten pens in his pockets. That's right, yeah. And this car is a, a Firebird, and it is $3,000, and that's a lot of money. It'd be 17000 today. Oh, man. Did the math. Oh. Yeah. So the uh, car dealer's like, can you handle a car like this? Uh, and he's like, yep. And he just drives off pretty much. Yeah. So. Can you, you think you can handle a car like this? And you're even watching it going, oh, come on, really? You're really going to fall for this shit? Yeah. It's kind of it's kind of a sloppy <laughs> a sloppy stealing a car uh, moment, but it, I guess he gets away with the car. So, um, yeah. like, that's not going to be conspicuous in um, Idaho. <laughs> I test drove a car once, uh, I remember, I think we're talking in my early, early 20s, and I remember the guy was like very adamant that I shouldn't drive too far even around the block, you know. If I drove off the around the block, then that was like, you know, hey, where are you going? <laughs> he had your number. He was like, I don't like the looks of this guy. There was somebody else with me. There was no way I was leaving the lot, you know. <laughs> was that your goth trench coat phase? It might have been, maybe, okay. when I wore okay. the, the uh, eyeliner. Yeah, maybe. And kind I, of on the car dealer side I, of this I one. played anyway. Bela Lugosi's Dead Every Night by Bauhaus, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so anyway, um, Clint Eastwood's given his sermon, and then what happens, Jordan? And then Jeff Bridges interrupts, if I remember, or something like that? Or, well, no. before that happens, um, a man comes in with a gun in the middle of, That's right. of the church. 
of his sermon and just start shooting at him. And then Clint Eastwood runs out the back. As, you could as not this make this sh- movie nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a lot of 70s moments in this or at film. at least I'll... this part you couldn't remake nowadays. Yeah. There's just a, there are a lot of 70s moments. This movie could only have happened in 1974 for sure. Yeah. You know, or that era. Because, yeah, he's getting shot in the church. And then we get a really good Clint Eastwood running scene. I don't think I've ever seen Clint Eastwood run this long <laughs> in a film through, the, yeah, through this it, wheat it, field. It's what I imagine if Clint Eastwood played the bionic man, what it would look like. I'm a six million dollar weapon. Uh, <laughs> the most powerful man in the world. <laughs> and I can take your head clean off. I'm more powerful than a 44 Magnum. <laughs> and so he's being shot at and he runs to this road and then coinkadink, coincidence, he runs into uh, Jeff Bridges or Jeff Bridges narrowly almost runs into him, yeah. swerves off the road and then hits the guy who's shooting at him. That's Yeah. Yeah. So that's our first fatality here in the first few minutes of this film. A lot of fatalities. Yeah. One of many. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Spoilers. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> a Clint Eastwood movie with people dying? What the hell you say? <laughs> so then Jeff Bridges is driving around this Firebird, and Clint Eastwood's stuntman jumps onto the car. That's and right. Just, it was, was his stuntman. <laughs> it, was, it was holding on. He's holding on to the car. And was it, looks, it one of the Knuts that doubled for him in this one? I don't know. No. More, or his normal guy. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah, the Knuts somebodies. I don't know. <laughs> So anyway, it's good good stunts in this film so far, um, or in this movie in general. Oh yeah, oh you mean yeah, go, yeah, okay, yeah. When he's jumping right into the Firebird, yeah. Oh my God, yeah, that is a hell of a stunt. He just climbs in as the car's uh, going. So action packed yeah. already. Eat your heart out, Dukes of Hazard. And then, so Jeff Bridges thought he was the cops. He's like, so wait, you thought that guy shooting at him was a cop? So you hit him with your car? That makes you a cop killer? Like, what? <laughs> Damn, <Yeah>. movie. <laughs> and it's Clint Eastwood. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, so um, Clint Eastwood tell, tells him that was just an old friend. And where are you going? He's like, I'm going south. And then we get this Thunderbolt meet Lightfoot. Lightfoot meet Thunderbolt moment. Yeah, it's like the buddy cop moment. It preceded all the buddy cop w- meeting moments, you know. But just like a, a Dirty Harry movie, I mean, I, I wonder if it were, um, Clint Eastwood's partners always die. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm worried for Jeff Bridges now if he's going to partner up with Clint Eastwood in a movie. I wondered that too. Um, <laughs> but I thought, nah, I blew it off, but yeah. Yeah. Clint Eastwood doesn't do a lot of buddy movies, really, if you think about it. No, no, no. It's my movie. It's my movie. <laughs> Unless there's a, an orangutan in it. So I guess uh, Jeff Yeah, Bridges... that's what's weird about it. He's able to, he's okay with sharing the screen with, you know, was that in two movies he did to that? That, that, that was a, almost a trilogy, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Every which way. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to sideline here about <laughs> Clint's career again, but, you know. Oh, yeah, we should talk about one of those movies. That's, uh, if we're doing random Clint Eastwood surprise movies from the 70s. Um, the Chimp Didn't Die, and, you know, it's surprising <laughs> that Clint didn't do, like, a cop movie later on with a dog in it as his partner, you know. I mean. Oh, in the 80s and 90s when everybody was making a movie with the dog? Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, even Jim freaking Belushi did one, and so did Chuck freaking Norris. And Tom freaking Hanks. Freaking Hanks, yeah. I sound like a comedian from Utah. I'm sorry. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Tonight at they the don't, Sizzler. The kind that don't curse, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. They don't so, say the fuck word. <laughs> the fuck word. <laughs> so Jeff Bridges, Jeff Bridges plays this movie's orangutan, and we get a Paul Williams song. I know. Bless Paul Williams. I love Paul Williams. No joke. No yeah, who joke. is Paul Williams for anyone who's under 100, George? Only, I mean, the greatest songwriter of all friggin' time. There, I did it again. I said friggin'. Paul well, the greatest '70s songwriter of all time? I don't know. No, Anthony, he is Bach, in my opinion. He is Mozart, man. He is him and Brian Wilson. There is no other. Well, maybe Trent Reznor, but uh, yes, those are our modern composers, our modern classical composers. <laughs> and it's a, it is it is a very um, interesting choices there, but it is a very '70s song. Yeah. Well, also, it you know, it was a union rule. If you did a movie back in 1970s, early 70s and mid-70s, I think it was a union rule that you had to have a Paul Williams song 
in the opening titles somewhere. Yeah. And it's a pretty good song. Yeah. Possibly a Guild Union rule. Possibly. Or have Paul Williams actually act in the movie. Act in the movie and have a song. But you're right. He was uh, it was everywhere. You... Depended on the budget. I think if it was above uh, $10 million, yeah, he had to act in it as well. And Paul Williams also needed his own trailer and a, a handle of Jack and, and a, a pile of cocaine. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, you're not. You're probably right, honestly. He had a, he had an extensive contract. No, that was I was in his Paul contract, Williams. yeah. No, I love him. I love him, too. God. He really is. I'm not joking about the song. I'm not being cynical about the songwriting part. I really think Paul Williams is a poet, honestly. But it, yeah, he is. He's fantastic. And Where Do I Go From Here is the song. And it is a very 70s song. The perfect song to have a long, drawn-out 70s driving sequence to while yeah. we listen to the song. You know. You think we could hire him to do a song for this show? I mean, for the this podcast? Wouldn't that be great? I mean, the robots <laughs> took my podcast yesterday. <laughs> now I'm all alone, here alone. <laughs> what do I listen to but the robots in my head? <laughs> I don't know. Some, yeah. I, there, there's something you could start off with, Paul Williams. Paul Williams will hire you. Yeah, how much? What? A few thousand, yeah. maybe. We'll save up for it. We'll, we'll crowdfund it. Yeah, crowdfund Paul Williams, everyone. Go to our Patreon. <laughs> We're going to have a GoFundMe for it. <laughs> All right. Or a Patreon, just for that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we get a good old-fashioned 70s driving scene, because these movies have to have, in the 70s, kids, there are, you had to have about 20 minutes of just driving. Yeah. You know? You had to have the driving car union still working, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Teamsters... Or be after your ass if you didn't. I will say that I think a lot of these actors in this movie, and I'll get to this in more in detail later, I think they do a lot of their own driving, which is cool to see. Like in today, today I think they, they really do. Yeah. Yeah, they green screen everything. Mm-hmm. That's really Clint Eastwood running. I'm mean, that's I'm not him hanging on the car, but that, I mean they're they're driving a lot of these cars, which is pretty cool. I know this budget was only four million dollars. I say only because that's that was just a base. That was the most modest kind of budget from back then, basically. That. Yeah, and there's a lot of realism in this movie. Like Clint Eastwood pulls his his shoulder out of socket, which you know he he rigs up this uh, contraption to kind of pull it back in. So he's a tough guy, and then you get a feeling that this guy isn't a preacher. Yeah, he maybe is a con. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> something's going on here, and then Lightfoot says, "Hey, I stole the car." You know, I'm just this drifter dude. What's up, man? Yeah. He's, he's really aimless. And then Eastwood is kind of this old salt, as we, we sort of figure out here. Mm-hmm. And then Eastwood's like, so do you like to spend money? Do you care how you get it? You know, because he just stole this car, right? So he's like, hmm, you know. And so they kind of hit it off. They're both basically drifters, I guess, that just kind of con their way around or something like that, or right? I mean, yeah, they're slowly how- figuring that out, I guess. <laughs> How lucky that the guy that rescued him was also kind of a, a shiftless con man as well, you know? Yeah. A criminal type. Maybe it's not like that. Maybe it's just Tyler Durden. Okay, I'm going deep now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting. <laughs> he didn't really exist. Just think about it, Anthony. There was no Lightfoot, man. Whoa, mind blown. He wasn't really there when they were drinking that beer in the kitchen that one time. He wasn't... He wasn't really sitting at the piano. It's imagination. It's his, it's his imaginary friend, Clint Eastwood. It's Jeff Bridges' imaginary friend. Oh, Think about it. Ooh, no. I am going to the chat boards with this theory, and people are going to be like, uh, who is yeah. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot? What is that? This is going to end up in the Reddit shower thoughts section after this. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Or Reddit high thoughts. I don't know. Then we get Dub Taylor in a cameo as a gas station attendant, who's full of conspiracy theories. And Wait a minute. who Dub is Taylor. Dub Taylor, man? Why do I know Dub Taylor? Wait a minute. I know that name. Wasn't he on a sitcom? Oh, no, no, no. Vic Tabak? Oh, well, on Vic Tabak also. We get to him later. No, Dub oh, no, Taylor no. was like in, I don't know, he was in a bunch of old westerns and things, you know? Yeah. Like, he was in Back to the Future 3. Oh, that's right. I think I know who you're talking about. He's just yeah. this crazy old dude who's always the crazy old guy. Um, he in was everything. in The Getaway. <laughs> he was in a bunch of Peck and Paul movies. I mean... I don't know. Just, just, to, just you'd know his face if you saw the it. town crazy or the old priest marrying somebody. Yeah. Basically, yeah, God, I'm Deb Taylor saying some crazy God and Sonic. God damn it, you know that that's kind of his <laughs> his world of acting. So yeah, um, love him, love him, love him. And then they get into um, they they carjack a car from a couple at a gas station. Yeah, 
By the way, I did Dub Taylor have an acting school back then that you could actually go <laughs> yeah. to for five hundred dollars for two week <laughs> <Yeah>. seminar. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay, go ahead. He's like, today we're going to talk about being a crotchety minor. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> so you 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 focus. You you empty yourself and and then you think you just you just let it flow like God damn it God damn it better you know? yeah, I can see it right now man it'd be like and the... scene first you want to go ask the director would you prefer old crusty man or older crusty miner <laughs> I can give you two different voices I'm an old crusty miner <laughs> I'm an older crusty miner <laughs> Dub Taylor can bring you know. He's a national treasure. He, he can give you whatever you want. He's, he's, I don't know, a sight to behold. John Saxon had his box of toupees. Joe, you know, <laughs> Dub Taylor had his box of minor, old minor, old preacher, <laughs> old, old, old whatever, older, older, old minor voice, whatever you need, you know, in a kit, ready to go. Oh, so concert, let's get back to this movie. Okay, so. Oh, sorry, anyway, yeah. So they're about to, uh, I think it's a Buick Riviera Misty, if you're listening. Uh, that they steal in early 70s. <laughs> She's going to text you about that. I know. So Eastwood and Lightfoot are about to split ways. And Lightfoot's like, come on, man. I want to be crime buddies, man. You know? I want this to be a buddy cop movie, man. Yeah. That's my best Jeff. That's my worst Jeff Bridges. <laughs> man. Worst. <laughs> Just got to throw man in there. Uh, uh, man. Yeah. You got to do the, the dude higher pitched, I guess, you know, in this yeah. version. This is yeah. baby dude, so yeah. Oh, man. Come on, man. We need to... I just want a new rug, you know? Anyway. Yeah, exactly. So he's like... Uh, Clint Eastwood's uh, character is like, ah, yeah, I'm too old to do crimes. Uh, and ah, then, so I'm then... Too old. He drops him off at a... <laughs> he drops him off at a train station. And then who do we see, Jordan? Wait, is this where we re- meet... Uh... Wait, no. I'm... Uh, I forgot. Who do we meet? I'm sorry. <laughs> George... Freaking Kennedy. Kennedy. Oscar okay. George winner Kennedy. George Kennedy. George Kennedy needs no introduction. Yes. My God. Man, but it, airport, list goes on. Um, yeah, if he did. Modern Jordan. romance. You ha- you know nothing. Oh, okay. Just, just everything. Cool Naked hand Luke. Naked gun. Cool hand Luke. Earthquake. <laughs> Earthquake, my list God. List goes on. List my... goes on. He was also in, sadly, Radioactive Dreams, Jordan. Sadly, a great talent like that. Radioactive. There you go with radioactive dreams again. Anyway, but George Kennedy. I hate that film. But he's a he's a joy. Earthquake came out the same year as this movie. I just realized actually seventy four. I mean, oh, he was acting a this lot. Was his year. He was acting a lot. And he was in a lot of Clint Eastwood movies too. But he was um, just a joy to behold. You know, this big galoot, this big New York actor. You know, he's just this awesome semi-comical presence tough when you guy. hired George Kennedy you got George Kennedy you know nothing <laughs> he just takes up the screen I just love it he's just you know and a lot of the actors in this movie I he's like great him. in this movie though I'm no, no kidding honestly. oh he's fantastic all, all and, cynicism and jokes aside and I mean he's good and then a lot of the other supporting actors just have this this everyman quality I, I agree I agree. I mean, that's what's the beauty of how they shot in a real location. As they, This is like how they, they started to do this more in the 70s and late 60s, obviously, yeah. after the Easy Rider era, where they would, you know, as opposed to studio, shooting on just the studio back lot of fake city street. Yeah. You know. They're really in these little towns. They pick a few little towns. They're really driving. It's it's. Yeah. People look like locals no matter where they got them, you know. Yeah. They usually just come into a place and, and just film. Everything looks real, though. You're right. Even for this time, even though you know it's a Clint Eastwood movie, you know there's baby Jeff Bridges, um, and you know there's George Kennedy. Most well, most of us that know George Kennedy's work, at least Sir George Kennedy's work. Look him up, man. Look him Look up, him people. Up. And and coming up, Jeffrey Lewis. Uh, or did I get there early? Sorry. Yeah, jumping ahead a little bit, but yeah, we'll talk about him in a sec. But yeah, um, everyone, look up George Kennedy. See his movies. He's fantastic. But like you were saying, there is the the vermissa. What is the term? Verisimilitude. Verisimilitude. Yeah. Verisimilitude. That, that Latin the, word that means truthfulness. Uh, that I learned yeah. from Superman the movie from <laughs> the Superman the movie documentaries on the 2006 DVD <laughs> or whatever the uh, no I'm sorry the uh, early 2000s DVD yeah, actually. But it, it's one of these movies that you really get a slice of life. They really film there and you get a, you get an idea of what the 70s was like. 
You know, yeah. And I really like that in these these sort of... It's like a time trip, in a way. Yeah. And so, anyway, this movie's all about getting laid. <laughs> you know? It's the 70s. It's the sexual it's the revolution, 70s. So we get a... to say. <laughs> it is the 70s, man. A lot of sex. Before AIDS, people. A lot of sex, a lot of nudity. So, you know, this is not a kid's film. Rated R. No, you actually see Full Frontal at some point. I mean, I'm not Many be points. skipping ahead. Yeah, I might Many be, Am I skipping ahead again? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. After seeing this, I first saw this movie, Jordan, when I was like a uh, like a teen, like an early teen, and I remember liking it a lot. And now I'm now I'm like maybe I know why I liked it so much. <laughs> like, there's the a promise lot. of nudity. There's more than the promise of nudity. It's and full then, frontal. It yeah, it's a French film by God, practically. Anyway. Yeah, true. So Jeff Bridges like just picks up this chick outside the bar. He's just like get in the car, and she does because it's the 70s. Yeah. And then they go to this hotel where uh, he, he brings these two girls back to this hotel where he and Clint Eastwood uh, or yeah, Clint Eastwood's character um, are staying. He brings these two chicks back just, just to bang. Like, oh, that's right. Oh, my yeah. God, the 70s, you know? <laughs> what a wonderful time. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> what a marvelous God. time, as Peter Griffin says. Yeah. <laughs> this chick, this girl just wakes her friend up in the middle of the night, sneaks out of her parents' house, and then she just goes to this hotel room and hooks up with... Clint Eastwood, who's like 50 in this movie or whatever, however old he is. Yeah. And you're just, and it's the same thing happened in Magnum Force. He's like hooking up with chicks who are old enough to be his daughter. That must, that must have been something that Clint Eastwood just insisted upon in all of his films. He's yeah. Like, I, I got to have a scene where, well, you know, uh, there's a naked woman who's half my age. You got to show me kissing the girl all over. I mean, all over and over <laughs> again. <laughs> So we we get a <laughs> Clint Eastwood. There. We get a, <laughs> uh, then we get a, another. We get a Clint Eastwood love scene. You know, sex scene, which is yeah, where everyone, which is kind of sexy. I, I guess. I, I guess. I guess. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Seems a little weird. It feels, it feels like I'm watching my uncle do it or something. I know exactly. <laughs> in a weird way, it's Clint Eastwood. It feels like family. I've seen him in everything. It's like. You know, it's like watching Robin Williams in a sex scene, you know, it's like uh, your uncle that passed away in a sex scene, you know, hot and wet. That's good when you're in the, in the jungle, but not when you're with a woman. Yeah. And so, no, uncle, uncle, no, stop it. I don't want to see this. Uh, uncle Mike. No, <laughs> Jordan's having flashbacks. <laughs> Sorry, Anthony. I didn't mean to do it. So we do Thank see, for explaining. Um, yeah. Luckily, I don't think we see Clint Eastwood's bare ass, which is good. Thank God. Thank and God. Then, I mean, he's in shape. I'm not knocking his shape. He's got a great figure for his age. I mean, I'm not knocking yeah. that. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. He's got he's got a bunch of bullet hole scars. So something's up with this dude. He's not a normal sort of fella. Yeah. And then, Those are hot, though, actually. Yeah. Chicks dig dudes with <laughs> bullet wounds. They do. <laughs> anyway, this chick does. And, but he's an asshole. He doesn't want to give her a ride home after all that sex. Like, what a dick. Yeah, that's a dick move. Um, I've learned that the hard way when I was a kid, you know. Yeah, a kid. A kid. When I was a single kid. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta drive him home. Don't be a dick, guys. Drive him home afterwards. Drive him home, gentlemen. That's a public service announcement. I'll give it to you by Wilford Brimley. Drive him home. Drive him home often, kids. <laughs> Don't leave him stranded. Feed him too, by the way. Take him to take him to breakfast at IHOP. <laughs> they need the business, by the way. And, and, and I'll do like George Kennedy. Yeah, you know, give him a ride home. Oh. Anyway. I'm sorry. We were talking about the 1974 movie, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. Still, anyway, in progress. And in so, progress. He's an asshole. He's not going to give her a ride, and she's like, "Well, I'm going to run outside and, sc- and scream rape." And yet another '70s movie movie moment. Yeah, there's no way you'd put that in a movie nowadays. Fuck no, you man. You wouldn't say that in a movie nowadays. You wouldn't joke about that. You don't in the yeah. '70s. You know, ha ha. Like rape was funny apparently. So she ju- she runs out and she screams rape. And yeah. So he's like, "Get back in here!" You know, here's some money. This is back in times when European distributors would throw a rape scene in for extra measure for extra box yeah. office. You know. I mean, that's how sick it was in the 70s, you know, just and explaining to, it. to joke about it. Yeah. Oh, and just joke about it nonchalantly. It was no big deal in the 70s, sadly, you know. Yeah. So anyway, it is the 70s, and we get a lot more moments like that. And then, so, Red, uh, or George Kennedy's character is named Red, and Jeffrey Lewis is in there. Um, and who is Jeffrey Lewis for everybody, Jordan? 
the great Jeffrey Lewis. He's been in everything. I mean, all the way up to Tango and Cash from this movie. I mean, and yes, he's the father of also uh, Juliet Lewis from Christmas Vacation, Natural Born Killers, list goes on, du from Dust Till Dawn, you know. But Jeffrey Lewis had a, had a big career way before Juliet Lewis and still even after for a long time until his, I think, did he, did, did he die not that long ago? Jeffrey Lewis? Know. Is he still um, alive? I think or should I Google? God, I... He, uh. Yeah, he died in 2015, Jordan. Thanks for bringing the podcast to a screeching halt. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm crying, Danny. I'm sorry. Let's all lay our head down for Jeffrey Lewis. Let's all put our heads down. Say a prayer. Yeah, but his daughter, <sighs> okay. uh, Juliette Lewis, is just... Um, just a treasure as well. So. Yes, just as brilliant. She got her daddy's DNA. Jeffrey Lewis would play everything, though. My God, he could play everything. She didn't get her daddy's hairline. Thank God. So, anyway, so they, uh, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, well, I guess he's not Thunderbolt yet, but um, Clint Eastwood and uh, uh, Lightfoot are at this cafe, and then, it's crazy, Lightfoot just got laid, now he's trying to hit on the waitress. Like, damn, dude. He does on, not man. slow down. My God, this Lightfoot kid. I mean, jeez. Jeez, baby Jeff Bridges, you know, more more than a toilet seat is all I can say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so anyway, so so uh, Red and Eddie Goody, which is Jeffrey Lewis's character, are outside. And then th they leave and they just start shooting at these guys in broad public in front of this cafe. Like, damn, dude. Yeah, they feel like, I feel like these guys belong in a James Bond movie as well at the same time period. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> The backseat yeah. with a gun, you know. A diamonds are forever. A, exactly. Uh, you know. <laughs> Even a live and let die, you know, kind of duo that you just threw in there for odd measure, you know, just, <laughs> I don't know. A lesser Roger Moore movie, yeah. And like going so, to 007 and just get George Kennedy yeah. and, and uh, Jeffrey Lewis to play them and everything like that, you know. Yeah, so Bond, I got this uh, here uh, space laser. <laughs> yeah. it's not a it's not a space laser uh, it's a different thing you're looking for yeah <laughs> um don't talk to me like that don't tell me what it is i know what it is <laughs> <laughs> and then these two guys kind of have that big guy little guy yeah you know what i mean Comedy they're like the duo. burton ernie of this movie to add the sesame street flavor of this podcast review for no reason at all i don't know why <laughs> Unwanted Sesame Street flavor. They're literally Bert and Ernie. If it just to dumb it down and explain it the best. Well, I was thinking like you know, just like uh, Laurel and Hardy. You know, fat guy, little guy. Yeah. You know. Well, hey Bert, what do we do now? We have a gun on him. <laughs> Want me to kill him, Bert? Hey, yeah, I told you to keep the gun on him. <laughs> hey, hey, tell him to slow the car down. Well, I'm the one with the gun, Bert. <laughs> and so anyway, they they shoot him up. They shoot yeah. up the car in front of this cafe. We get a pretty thrilling 70s uh, car chase scene. So 70s yeah. had cars moving very slowly through the countryside and also chase scenes. You needed both of those in the movie. This movie has both. Yeah. After French Connection, had to have a chase and everything. You know. Yeah. And it, it has uh, a lot of off-roading in cars that are not meant to go off-road. So yeah. check that box as well. And so then they get away and Light, Lightfoot is like, um, or they, they drive off road and the cars wreck and then so they have to walk there. There's a lot of walking in this movie as well. Like they don't have secure transportation for a lot of this movie. I know. <laughs> and they're all walking around in the 70s kind of shoes. I mean, Clint Eastwood, I think, is wearing sneakers for once in this movie. And then, yeah. you know, but Jeff Bridges is wearing boots every time. And I don't know how Jeff Bridges survives wearing the leather pants in those conditions. It looks like it's hot. Yeah. And, you know. I know from a fact wearing leather pants is like wearing a wetsuit in those conditions, you know. Well, I thought I thought it was. Well, I don't know. I thought it was more polyester, but that too. Even my God, the polyester pants, jeez. But he's got to look. You got to look good when in you're summer, doing crime. It looks like summertime in Montana, so it's got to be hot, you know. I mean, well, it certainly wasn't winter time in Montana. That's for sure. <laughs> And so anyway, he pitches um, the idea of them robbing a bank, and then Clint Eastwood's like, I'm too old for this shit, you know? Or I'm too yeah. old for this shit. And then they have there's a very surreal scene in which this crazy guy picks them up in this truck. Oh, uh, or, or in this, this hot rod car. He's yeah. got that cage in the front of it. I don't know. And he's yeah, what's in weird. the cage? Yeah, what's in the cage? Is it like a bird? I forgot. Or what the fuck is that? And it was cage? a fucking raccoon. So he's got this raccoon oh, right. in the cage. <sighs> he's like, get in the back seat. And then 
there's all these insane ramblings. I can't understand what he's saying. I guess we're not really meant to understand. It doesn't matter, but he's yeah. just balls crazy. If you thought Dub Taylor's uh, character was ranty and crazy, this guy's like, like I'm worried for them. Yeah. It, it's, it's literally insane. He comes out of another movie. You know what I mean? He comes out of a, a David Lynch film. Yeah, he came out of a horror film. Like he came out of a Chainsaw Massacre ripoff or something. You know? Yeah. And, then, and there's subtitles that says, you know, Jesus is coming. I don't know. Yeah. It's in, it's weird. And so he stops the car, and then he, he just opens the trunk. And what's in the trunk, Jordan? A dead body. No, I don't remember. What is in it? Oh, that is it. Did you watch this movie, Jordan? I did. I this faded a couple weirdest... of times. <laughs> oh, already? It was late at night. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was watching it again even to pick up on things, but yeah. Were you not entertained? <laughs> I, was, I love this movie, actually. Really? Oh. Oh, we'll yeah. talk about that more later, but yeah. <laughs> Um, no, it's bizarre because he opens up his trunk and in, in it there must be 50 white rabbits, like pet rabbits from How did I store. miss that part? Oh my God. How'd you, how did I you did miss, miss that totally. And so he lets the white rabbits out and he's got this shotgun and he starts shooting at them. I'm sorry. I think I grabbed a beer on that part. Anyway. Oh my God. It's fucked up. <sighs> oh my God. And you're like, what now kind of movie is this? This is like an outtake from Night of the Lepus. Only Clint Eastwood and yeah. uh, Jeff Bridges <laughs> are in it. Hey, man, uh, what's with all these giant rabbits? All right, Lightfoot, just shut up and let me think. Don't you know anything? These are the rabbits that kill. Was that too Jack Palance? I'm sorry, shit. That was a little Jack Palance, yeah. We need need raspier, Jordan. Take two. Maybe it was Jack Palance, okay? (laughs) And so anyways... So, Jordan, do you think these two... Okay, I don't... Well, I'll just go back to the bunnies. I don't think any of the cute little bunnies were killed. I could be wrong. I think he's shooting Thank around. Thank God. Please. And so then, Please, not this movie. I hope no bunnies were harmed. Yeah. Every 10 minutes, Clint Eastwood has to punch somebody out in a movie, so he punches this guy out, and they take the car. But let me ask you this question. Do you think that these two, Clint Eastwood and Jeff Bridges, have chemistry in this movie? I do believe they do, honestly. They re- they have an odd kind of chemistry, but it, it, it is a chemistry. Absolutely. On screen. Absolutely. They definitely, it's definitely the best buddy cop chemistry ever, honestly, I think. Really? I think wow. so, yeah. They seem like they strike it off in a weird, odd kind of way. They're definitely yeah. an of odd dynamic of acting. Like, Jeff Bridges clearly wants to do more takes, you know, yeah. than Clint Eastwood. <laughs> Clint Eastwood wants, wants to move on. We're done with this scene. God exactly. damn it, shut up. Um, so anyways, you know, they're, they're just telling each other about their, they're having a dreamy walk by a lake and <laughs> as you do in the seventies and they're, oh, yeah. uh, they're just kind of telling each other about their histories and stuff. And then for some reason, uh, Clint Eastwood's character knows a lot about bank vault construction. That's right. Yeah. And then he reveals that he is Thunderbolt, you know, with the press dub Thunderbolt, this famous bank robber. Yeah, we have a title here. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and then fucking Jeff Bridges. I just, ugh, I wanted to kick, I just, this movie, ugh. That I like that moment. scene. I mean, I, I'll, I don't know. I thought, I thought, I liked that scene, actually. Yeah, because Jeff Bridges says, uh, uh, yeah, man, we've got a title, man. You yeah, know? basically like, he does, yeah. Oh, man, <laughs> we've got a title, Lightfoot. man. Lightfoot, that's kind of, that's kind of a thing, man. Life, my name's Life, but your name's Thunderbolt. I mean, how's that sound? That, doesn't that, or yeah, basically mm-hmm. he says, doesn't that have a good sound to it? <laughs> Uh, you didn't like that. You didn't like that part. I think this is a pretty funny movie, and there's a lot of jokes, but some of the jokes don't land. But I guess that's okay. I'll I'll leave that to people to decide for themselves. If they, if Chris Farley ever had, uh, you know, Jeff Bridges on the Chris Farley show that he did on SNL, <laughs> you know, and he was like, "You remember that moment where you 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 asked Clint Eastwood, you know, what's your name, and he says Thunderbolt, you know, remember? That was cool. That was awesome. And you say, and you say. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, isn't that awesome? That was that was awesome. I could you could see that, right? <laughs> yeah. That now, now you now you just made me think. I guess there is kind of uh, going back to George Kennedy and Jeffrey Lewis. There is kind of a, a Chris Farley, David Spade vibe between those two. But then I, then I was thinking like, well, what if what if they remade Thunderbolt and Lightfoot with Chris Farley and David Spade, like Black oh. Sheep Two or something? Oh my <laughs> you know? God, what if they pre-made Tommy Boy? With George Kennedy <laughs> and Jeffrey Lewis in those Ooh. parts. Ooh. George Fantasy Kennedy, casting. Chris Farley. 
Don't you wish your AI could do that, Jordan? Don't you wish your little AI generator could make that? I'm going to go see. <laughs> Jeffrey Lewis as David Spade. <laughs> they have like a reverse dynamic, though. But anyway, so Lightfoot is, yeah. So he's like, you're that famous bank robber, man. And then he says, you used a cannon to shoot through the bank vault, right? Like, oh, shit. This was some kind of robbery, right? You did it before that movie Thief, man. <laughs> From 1981, that's going to come out years from now, man. <laughs> and then Clint Eastwood, he's like, who are those guys, man? And he's like, well, those, you know, Red was an old Korean war buddy, and Eddie Goody is the driver. And then you get some old bank robber reminiscing about the old heist. The old heist days, that's right. The old heist days, yeah. And and you get a lot of heisty details. And I... I loves me a heist movie, Jordan. I love scenes where people are sitting around planning things. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, right. So we get that a little later on. Um, spoilers. Is that what we love as the audience, you think, is is the planning parts? I mean, we see that in a lot of the heists. I mean, even Reservoir Dogs has the planning scene, more or less. Yeah. You know? it's, um, it's, like a, it's like a training montage. It's like something you want to see, you know? Yeah. In, every, in, in, in movies where things are about to happen later. Even like um, a movie, I'm going to go really deep cut here. Only certain people in the audience will know what I'm talking about. Straight Time, 1976, two years after this movie, the Dustin Hoffman. Even as awry as things go on that heist at the end of that movie, they still have this odd planning scene you know, before that, you know, even, even in that movie, if I remember correctly. You know, you're going to go yeah. in, they're, they're going to go in, this is how it's going to go down. Yeah. Well, it loves me a good old-fashioned heist movie, and we got one here. And then Clint Eastwood says in that earlier robbery, they stole $500,000, which would be $2.9 million in today's dollars. Wow. That's all? <laughs> no. Yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, they don't have a car, Jordan. I don't they, have they, that they, much. I'm just These joking. guys don't have any money. It's not like I have that much in my bank, honestly, folks. <laughs> Is that not good enough for you? Gosh, big, <laughs> I'm just big money honestly. Jordan over here. That's all? I'm just, I'm just, oh. I'm just kidding, honestly. <laughs> and I'm crying now. <laughs> I don't I've that lost much that much of my couch cushions. <laughs> anyway. No, no, that's definitely not me. I'm, I'm definitely... I'm definitely not like Tom Tom Likas over here. Like, I eat, I eat 10 grand for breakfast, babies. Hey. Tom Likas, that's an old... <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know where that came from. Grandpa Jordan, it's time, to, it's time for your uh, feeding. I think it is. I think I need my medication. Oh, where's the nurse? So he's like, so, hey, man, where's the money? And Clint Eastwood freaking tells him where the money is, man. What the hell is up with that? That's right, yeah. He yeah. just met this guy, you know? But I guess he did get him laid, you know what yeah. I mean? That's kind of cool, I guess. He told him also who shot Kennedy, even, I mean, like in that yeah. same moment. No, I'm just made that up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he just tells him everything. <laughs> he just gets on the couch and starts, well, my father was a rough man and he was an alcoholic. He told him his last I've... five addresses, even, in that same moment. <laughs> he gives him his social security number and his bank account number and password. That's after the it's camera crazy. pulled away and we just saw his mouth moving. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, the money is hidden in the schoolhouse in Warsaw, Montana. Not Poland. Okay. Not Poland, thank God. That'd be thank yeah, God. that'd be some globe trotting. No, we're sticking to Montana in this movie, George. Then you'd have to stick in like a Raiders kind of arrows there, you know, on that one, you know, arrow montage, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, they go to Warsaw to look for the money, and I think that's a little disjointed there. I wish they would set that up a little better. But they decide to go to Warsaw and find the money, and they right, find they go it. to Warsaw, Montana. Yeehaw! So what do they find when they get to Warsaw, Montana, Jordan? They find odd jobs, basically? Or no? Well, not yet. What they find out is they find out that the schoolhouse is gone and there's a new school there. Oh, that's right. That's right. It's a it's a new modern school, basically. Yeah. It looks like a pretty established uh, residential neighborhood, so I think that's weird. But I love this neighborhood, honestly. I love, I love this 70s-era Montana neighborhood, honestly. This 70s-era suburb Montana. It's very, very much like a time travel back to... <laughs> 1970s Montana suburbs. A lot of kids with like sort of collared rugby shirts or whatever, striped, you know, whatever That's those right. kid shirts were back. Come then. to the come to this subdivision where the neighbors are friendly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like a realtor comes out and gives a commercial. It's like, well, you know, you got to pay for the movie somehow. Yeah. And so anyway, 
They eat a lot in this movie. There's a lot of eating scenes. I've and noticed. a lot of beer drinking, especially Olympia beer for some reason, which you don't find a lot of. I don't even know if Olympia now exists even, even exists nowadays. That was a big beer in the 70s. I did some research. Um, <laughs> I've never seen the beer. Really? I've is had Olympia. Still... Yeah. Yes, it is. It is crap. It is, it is exactly what you think Olympia beer is. It comes out taste. of Olympia, Washington, I believe. Am I wrong? Out of the sewers of Olympia, Washington comes... <laughs> Out of the sewers of a... There's your commercial right there. <laughs> the, st- the, the stormwater runoff in uh, Olympia. I, I don't know why. I, I'll do my best Cliff Robertson. Uh, Out of the sewers of Olympia, Washington comes Golden Age Beer. <laughs> <laughs> It's just patchouli and seals. That's all I remember of Olympia, yeah. Washington, and my visits there. But anyway. Um, if you want a gold beer, you want a gold beer. You want Olympia. I, I ha- is it me or is Clint Eastwood always drinking Olympia beer in his movies? Did he have a sponsorship there? I think in Magnum Force he was drinking Schlitz, another weird okay, odd, that's right. odd, Never odd mind. beer from that time period. Which I've drank Schlitz. And yeah, I wouldn't drink Schlitz, Schlitz nowadays. Schlitz, Schlitz is, I don't think much. I'm sorry, Schlitz, if you're still around. I'm sorry, Slits. I'm still not. I'm sorry. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, that brought you Magnum Force, and this movie is brought to you by Olympia Beer. So, And so they're eating ice cream. Clearly, right? he has no taste in beer. And they get some ice cream, and then Red and Goody are hiding in the back seat. Now, Jordan, I don't think anyone could hide in the back seat with George Kennedy. And, That's right. And rem- remain unseen. We have to mention, too, it's pistachio ice cream, is it not? It is indeed pistachio ice cream. It made, me, it made me want some. That is a key point, a key uh, a plot point in this movie. Anytime I see people eating in movies, honestly, I want to eat no matter what the occasion is. Even if they're killing somebody and just taking a bite afterwards, I'm like, oh, that looks good. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Or if they have the gun to their head. Oh, that looks, that ice cream looks good, doesn't it? Yeah, they have a gun to their head right yeah. there in that scene. But that ice cream sure looks good, doesn't it? <laughs> there was there was a Chinese food eating scene in Magnum Force, and yeah, now I yeah. want some ice cream. Yeah. Gotcha. In that last movie we did a couple of weeks ago at Close Range, there was a Chinese food scene in that movie. That was a deadly scene itself, and I, I was like, well, look at that Chinese food they're eating. Doesn't that look good? Doesn't that <laughs> look like a good presentation there? <laughs> is that Kung Pao chicken? What is he having? Yeah, is that volcano chicken? So anyway. Is that Mushu pork? So George Kennedy or, or Red pulls the gun on him and he's like, drive. <laughs> and then they bring him to this place to kill them. Yeah, and I mean, poor Jeff Bridges. You can see that ice cream melting in his hand the whole time. And you just, I don't know why I feel for him with that melting ice cream. It makes him feel sorry for him. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, today an actor couldn't be, I don't know. There was a lot of, of very real acting in this and the fact that they're doing a lot of things like that, ice cream melting in your hand. An actor wouldn't be troubled by, uh, to do that nowadays. They would CGI in the dripping ice cream. Honestly, you know I mean? I'm going to say something too. This is really stupid. I'm going to say it, but I'm going to say it. It's really technical too. That ice cream looks real. It doesn't look like it's food hand, like it's done by a food handler or a food, um, or, you know what I mean? Those people that make the yeah. fake food for scenes or commercials. Usually, like ice cream yeah. in commercials is made from like a like a powdered sugar dough, apparently, like to look right. That looks like real ice cream because the way it's melting in his hand, honestly. Yeah, there's real food. It's not stunt food. So he did the melting ice cream stunt himself. No stunt hand. <laughs> no stunt hand for him. Yeah, and then Clint Eastwood was just like, yeah, you know. All right, we'll just buy some real ice cream. We don't have time for that uh, to make fake ice cream. He tossed it out the window so he could do the driving with both hands at least. And you know, I mean, yeah, I, I won't. Okay, I won't give Clint a hard time for tossing his ice cream. It would have been a lot bit. Oh, it would have been would have been a lot killer though. I'm just saying, like McConaughey would have been a lot killer <laughs> if he'd had that ice cream in one hand while he was driving. Just saying, it would be a lot more dangerous. A lot more dangerous. Even if it was in the gear hand. Just saying. So he gets in a fight with George Kennedy, not with the ice cream in his hand, sadly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And we get two movie titans, man, duking it out. True. This is like the best thing since that would come later, you know, Superman and General Zod, you know, Reeve and Terrence Stamp. Yes, this is before all that, though. These are two big titans in the 70s. This is like, you know, Bruce Lee fought James Bond almost, you know? Yeah. But I, I mean, it's kind of a short fight scene. I don't know. I wish there was more actual fighting. Two two giant acting titans though. You're right though. It's like it. It's like you know. God, you just love you love both these actors and they're great together. It's like if you film. actually made 
Pacino and De Niro fight each other back then in a movie, which yeah. never happened. <laughs> so anyway, they fight, and then Eastwood wins the fight, and he, and he has a gun on him, and he won't kill him. You're damn right he wins the fight. He tells him about the schoolhouse, and he said, well, we went to the schoolhouse, the school the house is no longer there and so they're all buddies now they're all just kind of that's sitting right. on a curb now he says like, there's nothing there now it's just jack black teaching that's all the <laughs> schoolhouse rock <laughs> school of rock and then uh and he's like well you know what are we going to do now and then they're all they're all buddies now and they're just like yeah they're all friends they're all buddies <laughs> it's so weird that these two dudes have been trying to kill them and come, who've come very close to gunning them down yeah. many times. And the they still half. trust them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the first half of this movie, right, are now, yeah. now they're just sitting there like, what are we going to do now? Like, now they're, they're best buddies. I can only, honestly, I'm going to give a psychological, like, era diagnosis of this. It's like 1970s trust. Like, the same kind of trust you have to where you don't have fear about hitchhiking back then. Because mm-hmm. apparently our parents didn't have fear about hitchhiking back then. <laughs> <laughs> Our yeah. grandparents didn't have fear about hitchhiking back then either. <laughs> I, I guess you're right. The movie's got to happen, but they're just I, like... That happens a lot in movies. Maybe it's that logic. I don't know. In 70s movies. I'm an outcast. You're an outcast. What are we going to do now? You nowadays, know? you wouldn't be as trusting, I guess, honestly. Nobody no. would be that trusting nowadays of a stranger. And, and, and these strangers who are who just held them at gunpoint, they just fought them. Yeah, there's nobody going, let's get away from these idiots now. You know, like, Clint Eastwood's not like, let's go. Let's get away from these people. Yeah. This movie's very cynical, except for, for that. <laughs> yeah. Know, like, you're buddies now. Let's let's be bank robbing buddies This now. is honestly one of two comedies written by Michael Cimino. Magnum Force and Thunderbolt and Lightfoot is another one, basically. I mean, you said you said yeah. it best on the Magnum Force review. Uh, it's, a, it's a comedy, more or less. You know, it's a satire. I mean, it, you know. Same with this one. Yeah, I agree. And, I mean, Deer Hunter was hilarious. I, I mean... Oh, that's... God, I laughed so much during that movie. I mean, in the three hours that movie was on. I And I actually sat through the whole three hours just <laughs> laughing my ass off, Anthony. <laughs> my God. We're talking about Deer Hunter, right? <laughs> so, anyways, um, uh, Life gets this brilliant idea. It's like, hey, man, why don't we rob the same place? Man, you know, <laughs> I, love and so, I love that's our impression of Bridges is just saying man in every sentence. <laughs> that's like, all he's, it's worse the than Dennis Hopper, you know. Oh, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and just using a higher pitch voice. <laughs> or he could be in Starman like, what is bank? <laughs> you just basically have to use the Starman and the Q voice from Tron, that other character mm-hmm. in Tron, the Q. The, I'm ready to merge now with the bit. Yes, you know, <laughs> I'm robotic, you know. I, I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> okay, so anyway, Lightfoot says, hey, we got this crew here. Why don't we just do the same thing? They won't expect it, right? To rob yeah. the same place two years later. And then something very realistic sort of happens. They really discuss the fact that they need money to fund a heist, which is which is pretty interesting. You don't normally see that. You know, normally it's like Ocean's right. 13 and everyone's just rich or whatever, yeah. you know, already. Uh, yeah, people forget that also even when they're using guns in a heist and ammo, that's money, uh, folks. That's that's going to ring up, folks. Cha-ching. Yeah. You know, even a weapon back in the 1970s is going to cost a couple hundred dollars, a good, decent uh, automatic weapon, you know, whatever, or even a you know decent Smith and Wesson. It's going to cost you know even one hundred and fifty dollars, even on the black market, probably. I'm just going by the taxi gun numbers, probably yeah. taxi driver numbers here. <laughs> yeah, it's not like they can go to Etsy and then uh, charge a machine gun from uh, <laughs> a twenty millimeter machine gun <laughs> to their account. They no. had Etsy back then in 1974. The computers were just bigger. They were computers were the size of a laundry machine back then, and they would have to look inside deep to see the numbers and where everything was going to go. They have to look in that big microscopic. No, I don't know. I'm just made that up anyway. And so, somebody painted the machine gun, and then... yeah, they had this big Terry Gilliam looking display, like in Brazil, you know, like the big magnifier looking at this tiny glass, you know. So then we see Clint Eastwood playing the piano, and I think he's really playing it. He's he does good. play. He actually does play piano. I know that for because oh, he played. He? Okay. he played in Bridges of Madison County for real, and he was oh. on the soundtrack of that and the soundtrack. He's on the soundtrack of his own movies with his own piano. Oh, really? He learned how to write music when he was a kid on his own. He didn't have a teacher. He actually like just did research and, you know. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, 
Fun fact. I knew that Today I learned. <laughs> T-I-L. Clint Eastwood knows the piano. Very John Carpenter of him. Tomorrow on the next podcast, we'll talk about Chevy Chase and his piano playing skills. Yeah. And little known, but George Kennedy plays the tuba very well as well. He's, he he's really good. He played with the London Symphony Orchestra even <laughs> at one point. <laughs> so anyway. You can um, YouTube it right now, folks. Look it up. You'll find it. <laughs> Yeah, I played uh, played the tuba. Uh, I played on Jaws. Yeah, one of my side <laughs> jobs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, George. Okay. Put it down. All right, put it down, George. <laughs> so then they hatch a little scheme, and Jordan, what is their plan? I forgot. They're going to go in and... No, what is the plan here? God damn. You're better by going into detail on these things. We don't really get the plan fed to us immediately. And even later on when they do explain the plan, I like the fact that they really, they don't tell you everything. But I, okay, yeah, it was in a bunch of series of scenes, right? I thought. Yeah, so they just start doing things. They start scoping out the town. They go to this drive-in. Yes, yes that's what it is, yes. But we know that they used a gun the first time, so they're going to apparently use a gun the second time. So right down to, to seeing that, yeah, the old man is going to like ignore certain things or like be asleep at certain times when he's guarding the shack there at the entrance exactly. or whatever. Yeah, exactly. You're talking about that moment in the movie, exactly. Yeah, because okay, yeah. the old bank robber that they worked with died, but they're just like, and they're they're not... They they're not exactly dummies, but the the mastermind is not here. So I like, like that though. They saw you tracing through steps, like going you know to the location first. That they're actually in tracing steps of where they're yeah. going to go. That's how you do it in reality, honestly. No matter how funny this movie is, you know, in places. It's a really how to rob a bank, and I like that because they get yeah. jobs at the they all get jobs at the places they're going to be at mostly. Right? Yeah. Right down to, uh, am I jumping ahead or this is around this time when yeah, you're you about to jump Clint ahead? Smith. I can feel it, Jordan. You're about to jump ahead because what happens, <laughs> and I want to break for this is, and everyone like I think Goody's car is some old Mercury from the '40s, and I, I didn't look that up, and I'm sorry. Yeah, um, but they have this beater old car. Have we got to the ice cream scene, the ice cream uh, job scene yet? <laughs> Not yet. We're almost okay, there. Okay. <laughs> but I want to tell a story, right? So okay. they're working in the steel factory. And just for the podcast listeners, Jordan and I were roommates for quite some time, and we lived in this house that was across the uh, park from a high school. George, do you remember what that high school's name was? That was called Woodrow Wilson High School, yes. Yeah. And who who gives sort of a, an extended cameo as Clint Eastwood's buddy in town in this movie? Uh Woodrow Wilson? Bert, no. <laughs> Burton Gilliam. Burton oh, Bert, Gilliam. Oh, yes, Burton Gilliam. Duh. Burton Gilliam from our area, the our neck of the woods of Dallas, yeah. Texas. Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles, yeah, from uh, Leaving Las Vegas. Or- also, Back to the Future 3. He's re- He was reunited with Dub Taylor in Back to the Future 3. Oh, thank you, yes. And also, um, uh, Honeymoon in Vegas with Nicolas Cage and... Sarah Des- Jessica Parker, yeah. The, We're the Flying Elvises, Utah chapter. The list goes on. But Jordan, Burton Gilliam graduated from Woodrow Wilson High School. No shit, Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> True like story. Burton Gilliam story, yeah. <laughs> I just dumb, thought that dumb was Burton a... Burton Gilliam voice coming, sorry. <laughs> no shit, Anthony. <laughs> a useless piece of trivia. Anyway. He was on local radio shows, I remember back then, or at least one local radio show a lot back then. I won't name the show because it's, it's yeah. not on the air anymore, but it doesn't matter. And TV but. commercials as well. He was in a lot of TV commercials. So yeah, yeah, man. Everything the there locally. He would be on like car dealership commercials back then and then Dallas, Texas when he was alive. But you know what? That may have been uh, an obscure piece of trivia, but you know what isn't an obscure piece of trivia? There was this this lady that comes in and talks to Clint Eastwood's character uh, Thunderbolt and says she wants his his social security number. Yes, you know I love that. Yeah. Do you know who that scene. is, Jordan? Who was that? Yeah, she looked familiar. Claudia Lanier, who oh. was a backup singer for Ike and Tina Turner, amongst many others, and she dated both Mick Jagger and um, David Bowie. Mick Jagger wow. and David Bowie. Wow, you don't say. Oh my God, that's that's fascinating, actually. Though. And yeah, this, uh, allegedly the song Brown Sugar by the Stones was written about her. Oh, wow. And she's like, I think she's wearing a wig in here, although she looks great in the wig. Oh, yeah. But so anyway, 
Lightfoot is working as a like a lands in at a, in a landscaping company, and then there's a desperate housewives moment where we get full frontal from this this lady oh, yeah, this standing is, in her. Yeah. Where Jeff Bridges looks like he might, you know, he's got the leather pants on. He's he's got his shirt off. He's all. But how? Oh my God! It's just how much is being thrown at him in this movie. But uh, yeah, yeah, he's all. But he's all looking like a young Greek god. Yeah, and he's all he's all doing the he's all doing that uh, post hole dicking. It looks like or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I did post hole digging for my granddaddy once, and I knocked myself in the head. It was a different kind of pole operation, luckily. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and like yeah, he sees this full frontal bush in the window. I'm not talking uh, a plant life either. I'm talking yeah. full frontal female bush. Very 70s. Very Another 70s. 70s moment. Yeah, we see a lot of nudity. Just like we inviting said. him in in every way, uh, not just through the door, through every other door downtown. <laughs> and then we get a comic relief moment, and that is where Goody is driving an ice cream truck. It's like a little tuk-tuk thing. I thought the scene was funny, actually. As dumb as it is, yeah. Yeah, and George Kennedy jumps in the ice cream uh, truck with him for no reason. I don't know. He needs to get a job, but he, he doesn't want to. And then That's... this kid runns up to them, and they're trying to look at, <laughs> make sure they're on the route. And what the hell happens when the, when the little kid comes up and gives them some sass? Oh, you talking about what George Kennedy says to yeah. him? He says, yeah, he, yeah, go fuck a duck, kid. <laughs> no, Which maybe we need, so- I, I'm going to go, I, maybe I need to go find you the uh, clip for that just to use in this podcast for critical purposes. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> just for a punchline um, every now and then. Yeah, go fuck a duck, kid. Or maybe you just repeat that. I don't know. You're on the wrong street. What? I said you're on the wrong street. What's she talking about? I mean. You're too early. You're supposed to go down the next street first and then come up this street. Well, <clears throat> listen. While we're here, can I sell you anything? No, I'm waiting for Judy Ann. They have a bitter flavor of pistachio. Look, kid, go fuck a duck. Yeah, I remember Dick Tracy was, go suck an egg, and George Kennedy's like, go fuck a duck, kid. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Damn, I have a rating moment. system in mind already. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So they're they're scoping out the town, like the money order places where the alarms uh, are, and there's this um, old schlubby sort of fat dude there who works yeah. there, and um, that guy Jordan is played by the great actor Cliff Emick, who has played. The fat guy in so many different movies and, and television shows. You're fat the shaming nerdy him. fat oh, guy. I'm joking. He's just classic. <laughs> What'd you say? I was joking. I said you're fat shaming him. <laughs> I'm not trying to fat shame him. I'm trying to. I'm trying to fat, fat praise him. As, okay, as, you're saying being fat was his bread and butter. He's chubby. He's he's. That a, didn't come look. off right. Oh. <laughs> oh. Damn, I'm not being sensitive enough either. Oh. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Yeah, I'll show acting up. was Never his mind. quarter pounder with cheese. Yes, it was. Oh, anyway, no. Ah, ee. no, he's a great actor. I like him. That's why. I'm, that's why I'm calling him out because he's in a lot of stuff. You know his face. He was beautiful. And then we see uh, Jeff Bridges working with uh, the landscaping company, and who works with him at the landscaping company? Jordan. Uh, is it Gary Busey? No, I'm jumping ahead. Fuck. God damn. No, it. Oh. you're 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 jumping right in place where we yeah. should be. Yeah, it's Gary Busey. Gary Busey, who is, we find out through dialogue, uh, you know, I'm your brother-in-law, man. Jeez, you always coming to me at the oddest hour, man. It's 9 a.m., man. Jeez, crash, man. That's the worst Gary. Gary yeah. Busey, probably. He's talking to the boss, which but is... But yet big... he agrees to letting him use his big, giant-ass uh, truck, yeah. um, like a delivery kind of style truck uh, for this... Yeah. I guess it's for this heist, obviously. It's to include... In, yeah, Yeah, and he was talking to the boss, Vic Tabak. That's what you're referring to. Vic Tabak from, uh, yes, Martin Scorsese's movie. Yeah. Alice doesn't live here anymore. Yes, yes. And, and the TV, TV show. And the TV show, Alice. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't mean So all-star be. cast, man. TBS power. Going you got on Gary there. Busey. Vic Tabak, Tabak. everybody. <laughs> Doug Taylor, god damn. Doug Taylor. You know, Bert Gilliam, god damn it. Sir Bert Gilliam. This is like the Academy Awards night here. Like, just uh, all stars. Tonight, all the stars come out for the premiere of Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. Yes. It's, it's, it's really more like Circus of the Stars. But anyway. Oh, yeah. We'll see Vic Tabak doing a handstand, doing gymnastics. <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll see George Kennedy try to get out of a low chair. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see George Kennedy lion taming. <laughs> get the fuck back. <laughs> What's with these lions? Christ. Why'd they throw me in here? I never any experience lion taming. <laughs> That's the worst George Kennedy ever. Yeah. That's the worst George Kennedy. Anyway. So, uh, um, uh, mine's not much better. That sounded like your Johnny Ramone or something. That sounded like your impression of Johnny Ramone. Oh, Dee Dee Ramone? I, I wanted to be like a rap star, and I don't know why, uh, you know, people wouldn't accept me. I guess because I'm not black. I don't know. It was just like, oh my God, that's my Dee Dee Ramone. Marky Ramone is what I meant to say. That sounded like your impression of Marky Ramone. Oh, Mark, Marky Ramone is like, you know, oh... Uh, I donate to the Republican Party. You know what I read in the papers here? We're spending too much on the federal budget. That's what my Vic Tabak sounded like. It's just like that impression. Sound like your impression of Marky Ramone. That, that's <laughs> that's how I like my my punk rockers is to old school punk rockers is to be you know talking on conservative radio. But anyway, and sound like they're from New York totally. So then we get I don't know where they get this canon from. Like I guess like I said Etsy. But we see uh, Jeff Bridges and George Kennedy actually doing physical manual labor in this movie. Yeah, they went to a public storage and pulled that cannon out of nowhere, and uh, <laughs> somehow I don't know. I guess they it got looked like a cannon from the war. They I guess they had it shipped over from being in the war after being in the war in some previous movie. I guess, yeah. I mean, I guess you just <laughs> assume that they got it from uh, the prequel. They got it from. The um, the same place they got it before, but it's ain't no big thing. We got this cannon. They don't really explain that, but but it's in pieces in these big boxes, and they're just picking these boxes up with the barrel in one piece and the yeah. stand in another, and those have to be heavy. Yeah, it looks like it belongs on a helicopter. It looks looks like a di- like a sort of Gatlin type gun. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, they're really doing the work. They're yeah. really these actors are really picking up these heavy boxes and moving them around. And I think that's fantastic. It, it, it true lends, lends to the realism. I'm that like, had Damn. to be heavy. Oh, oh, absolutely. That's real metal. So, yeah. And then we get some pretty good, uh, bank robbery planning scenes. They're talking about the electronics and the timing at this time you go here and, and then, you know, I want you to do this at this time and then you're going to do this. And so Is, are you talking about after when George Kennedy's uh, asking about like after, after Jeff Bridges tells him what happened with him and the lady at the suburb house, or is that way beyond that, or no? Yeah, that's that's after that, or that's during that scene, I think. And then they kind they're of all kind drinking of, a more Olympia beer, of course. More Olympia beer, brought to you by Olympia. God, it's like a big advertisement for Olympia beer. They must have been drinking Olympia, a lot of Olympia beer. Well, they're paying for this movie, aren't they? Damn it! I wonder if they had like a truck backing up on on like on behind the scenes on this movie of a lot of oh, Olympia you know. beer can, like fresh Olympia beer, you know, like. Doot. Dude, dude. <laughs> a lot of Olympia beer there. No, but um, yeah, a lot of Olympia beer here. They, it's like they, they had to keep George Kennedy hydrated because he drinks like a case of Olympia beer every couple hours. <laughs> it was in his contract, I think. You know that he had to be marinated in Olympia beer or ma- marinated in some type of beer. You know. Yeah, you know, he's got to have a, a just just a big old bucket of turkey legs and uh, a lot of Olympia beer. A case of beer a day, at least, at the very least, a, a case of beer. That's twenty four beers for you people out there. How much a case? Yes. <laughs> So, um, and Eastwood's reading off a cue card as he uh, is talking about the bank robbery with all this technical stuff, but it's all very good detail. So basically, Lightfoot has to distract and tie up the alarm guy, and then the other's going to break into the vault, assemble the gun, and then they're going to get the money and then sneak away at the end and go up to a drive-in. They don't give you all the details, which I kind of like. And props to you for explaining that perfectly, just like that. That was like the trailer version right there, man. Props to you for explaining that properly. Yeah, and so how are they going to distract the alarm guy? There's two alarms. There's one that goes to the bank president or whatever vault manager's oh, house. Oh, yes. Okay, Literally I remember in this, his, yeah. Yeah, in his bedroom. And then there's another one that goes to the the, the fat guy. The, sorry, the... Um, the nerdy guy guarding the shack. The, the ample-bodied nerdy. gentleman, yeah, who is <laughs> who's guarding the shack. Uh, the, uh, the alarm... The Wells, or what I'm is sorry, it? ample-bodied gentlemen. We're sorry. We didn't mean it like that. On behalf of all ample-bodied gentlemen. The plus-size curvy gentleman who, who is oh, working. Oh, God. At the, the humanity. Am I making it worse? <laughs> who is working. The gentleman who is working at the The big and beautiful Western gentleman, Union. yes, who's working the guard shack. No, he's not working the guard shack. He's the working with the big, beautiful, the, uh, nerdy gentleman. God, I don't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> 
he's monitoring the alarm, so they have to distract him. And how is Jeff Bridges going to distract him, Jordan? Uh, with uh, Well, George Kennedy finds a wig in a shop, a cheap, uh, feminine-looking wig, and um, takes it back. And, well, Jeff Bridges dresses up in drag, basically, and a really short short skirt from that time period that women would wear, <laughs> and pantyhose. And, then, and so pantyhose. The, the and skirt heels. And heels. And heel, yeah, big, thick heels from that time period, big clog heels. And has to wear the pantyhose and that. You talk about bold, this guy, Jeff Bridges. I have to say that's bold. And I'm just talking because it doesn't look, I mean, he's got the, you got the pantyhose are constantly, clearly catching on the dress. Like very riding staticky. up or whatever. Yeah. Riding up and down constantly. And he's constantly having to move, move. And he's wearing, and he's wearing panties under there for full effect. <laughs> it looks like, and I mean, he's got the wig on. He looks really pretty. Honestly, I will say he looks great. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. He kind of, he's, he kind of looks, I don't he know. He pulls man. it off pretty he well. He's it passable. Off. He's as passable. they say. <laughs> <laughs> so not a bad choice. Not a bad idea, really. I mean, they could have gone worse in this movie. They could have made one of the other <laughs> actors dress They could have had George Kennedy in drag. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Hey, that's hot stuff. <laughs> or Eastwood. It wouldn't have looked good with Eastwood either. Oh, my God. Eastwood wouldn't have looked... I don't think... I don't, I don't know. My I'll name's go, Amanda. Yeah. <sighs> I'll go do an AI after this to see what Eastwood would look like in drag from that time <laughs> period. Just in my own curious way. Just for my own curiosity. Um, you know, but... I just don't see Eastwood in the drag, but after know. hours with Jordan, yeah, we, let's, yeah. Let, let's let those private moments uh, go unspoken. That's anyway. a podcast on a different link, anyway. And yeah, Bridges, yeah, and drag distracts this guy in the in the shack, the guard in the shack, distract, just knock, just tapping on the door, like, hey, hey, look at me. He doesn't even say anything. He just like, and then the but the guard, this guy in the shack, this poor guy in the shack that we keep, you know, calling fat or whatever. Or, anyway. This poor guy. We've moved he, on. He clearly looks lonely. He clearly looks lonely. So he's that's why he's so at porn. If you're not seeing yeah. naked women, you're definitely seeing porn. He's clearly you know? alone, and he's clearly distracted easily, and clearly just like so easily easy, easy to lure with even somebody in drag, just you know, stopping to and and not so great drag. I mean, you know, you couldn't put Jeff Bridges on Drag Race and compete with those gals. You know, you couldn't yeah. throw his, his character in there and compete. Only if he was trying to con his way through it. You know. Yeah, yeah. That now you just made me sad for the guy. Damn. Anyway, but that's the joke, though. That's the whole joke is they're getting this guy to dress up like a chick. And know? man, he just distracts him so easily. I mean, so that, I'm just saying he opens the door so easily for this guy because of how lonely yeah. he is. Clearly, they could have. Yeah, it's really and it's sad. sad. <laughs> it's one more sad thing about this movie. Okay, I shouldn't cry that soon. I'm sorry. It's and too then, soon to uh, cry. <laughs> man up, Jordan. Man up. <laughs> I love you, Jeff Bridges. You look beautiful and drag in this movie. <laughs> I'm and crying so, for Jeff Bridges already. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Shut up. And so anyway, Lightfoot knocks the guy out. And then... Yeah. Oh, and that's so sad, too. He knocks the guy out. At the, he, the, the guy doesn't even get anywhere. The guy doesn't even get anywhere with Jeff Bridges. <laughs> well, did you want... Oh, never mind. I'm not going to ask that question, Jordan. But anyway... <laughs> So Eastwood dresses like a cop, pretends like he has red under arrest, and that's how he sneaks into the bank. The and they tie up the guard, uh, who opens, who lets them in. Everyone just lets people in in these movies. You I know? know that's what I mean. Once again, they just let them in. Yeah. That was just my point. And then so they put the gun together to blow up the bank. Then they blow the bank door with this cannon. That luckily they have you know ear protection on, but yeah. Uh, I still think a freaking cannon going off in a small bank vault would the shockwave or something would be. Did they even I wear any earphones on this? I forgot. Yeah, they did. They had glasses on. The safety was first. that enough? I safety mean, was first. that even enough? <laughs> no, man. Jeez, I'm just saying. I mean, I've heard on a Charles Band movie they blow shit up for real. They barely even had that production. So yeah, I mean, it looks very realistic. I'll tell you that. Boy, it does. It does. And they, and they do it like not just one blast. It's it's one loud blast, then another loud blast. I mean, I had the kids sleeping yeah. in the next room. Another and, loud blast, and I had the speakers on. <laughs> I had to turn it down on every blast. Yeah, nobody's hearing this. Like I, I yeah. guess they're in and out in seven minutes. But damn, I think I'd you know you'd yeah. hear that in a small Montana town. Like damn, dude, you know. Yeah. So anyway, they blow a hole in the side of the bank vault, and I like this. They don't fuck around with the combination or anything like that. They just blow up the the bank vault. You know. Yeah. You know, usually there's a safe cracking scene. And that became, this. like, more popular later on. That, this is the first time they kind of did it more, 
in this kind of situation or did anything yeah. like this. It became more common in TV shows in the 80s to do something like this even. Yeah. So anyway, Goody picks up Lightfoot, who's still dressed as a girl. And yeah. then they go and they get the money they out of the, the bank vault and then Eastwood's driving and then George Kennedy and um, or then Red and Goody get in the trunk, right, with the money and everything. And yeah, they just leave a mess. They just leave the gun there. How rude. And as they had planned in the heist, uh, Eastwood had said earlier, we I think we left out, like Bridges asked him, what are we going to do after all this? And he said, we will head to the midnight drive-in movie to escape. Something like that. Yeah. Which I loved, actually. I loved that line. That line, like, sold me big time. I'm like, oh, fucking awesome. Yeah. We get to go to the midnight. We get to go to the drive-in in this fucking movie. We get movie. to go to a drive-in. <laughs> Let's do it. We're in the 1974. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Anyway. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, they go to the drive-in. and But Red's shirt is hanging out the back of, of the uh, trunk, right? Yeah. So they pull up to the drive-in, and Jeff Bridges, um, or Lightfoot, is still dressed like a chick, which, you know, kind of works for the whole thing. Right. He snuggles up to, close to Eastwood. It's character, basically. Yeah. It kind of, I think Pee-wee's Big Adventure sort of like... Like this inspired Pee-wee's Big Adventure, that <laughs> copied moment. Copied that in that one that scene moment. where Pee-wee's dressed like the chick, yeah. Yeah, they're trying to get through some kind of thing. Yeah, they're trying to get through a police brigade, and he, they're in the <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I didn't think about that, that, that connection, yeah. But this was common back then in the driving era where they would try to sneak people in the trunk. So that's what they were, that's why she's looking out for that kind of thing at the booth, right? I mean, already. Yeah. The ticket lady is, you know, they're buying their tickets and Clint Eastwood is looking suspicious as hell, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. And then we, George Kennedy sneezes or, or coughs in the trunk, right? Yeah. And... She hears that, and you're right. It, so to her, it sounds like what, Jordan? I mean, it, it sounds like what's in the trunk, of course. Yeah, like you said, they're, they're trying to sneak somebody in. And that's when, like, they, they're getting away with it, but that's when the threads start to unravel. Right, right. That's when, uh, yeah, the shit starts to slowly hit the fan. <laughs> yeah, and so they, they're sitting there watching the movie, or it's just cartoons, I guess. I was, I was hoping they'd be watching something cool, but I, they didn't want to get the rights to something, I guess. So, yeah, they're, it's just like the opening cartoons, unfortunately. Luckily, they got there before the movie started. But then, so they're True. watching the movie, and then they hear all the sirens. Yeah. And then the sirens start getting closer. They're by the other property, though, right? But they, you hear them close yeah. still. Yeah. The, the drive-in is right by the bank, I guess. So they just drive from the bank immediately to the drive-in, which and is And they were smart. trying to hide out this drive-in, basically, right? Yeah. That... Oh, and I, f- I forgot to add this. Like, one of the things, Jordan, uh, one of the bank alarms went to the uh, branch manager's, like, house, right? Do you remember yeah. that scene? The scene earlier where they had the code, you mean? Where they held up yeah. the bank manager and they had the code to the vault to get into yeah. the vault to blow it up. and um, Yeah. Yeah, that was that scene, and <laughs> so, the, the, so one, the wife is like, "Don't harm my baby girl!" And then we see the baby girl in the room, and the baby girl is actually all grown up, um, <laughs> probably eighteen, nineteen, twenty-one, already old enough to have sex. And we see that and just going all body parts engorged and tingling, as Dana Carvey's <laughs> church lady character would say. You know, so yeah, she's she's going at it with her boyfriend. But Man, both it's like naked. porn style. Damn, almost. yeah. It's like softcore porn. Jesus. Another 70s moment here. Just like Magna Force again. Just like, oh man, just yeah. more, so, more yeah, softcore before, moment. Yeah. So, you know, before they go down to the vault to blow it up, Red and Thunderbolt, they go in with pantyhose over their faces and pull guns on the, the branch manager. And he's like... On their family. Yeah. In their house yeah. in the middle of the night, which is fine. In the house in the middle of the night yeah. to, to, cut the, to cut the second alarm and... Holding the... Yeah. He's like, oh, no, not again. Not you know? again. Yeah, no shit. That's the worst part. Because <laughs> they just did it two years ago. And he's like, oh, shit, man. It's, it's yeah. kind of a funny moment. Yeah, and then they... I did laugh on that. The parents escape, and then they go to the daughter's room, and they find her and her boyfriend tied up and yeah. naked. Yeah, and then, of course, they don't... I guess they don't think their daughter's having sex, because they're, they're in a shock about that as well. There's a naked yeah. dude, like, tied to her. Uh, on know, top when, of being robbed at gunpoint or yeah. whatever at gunpoint. <laughs> And God, only in the 70s. Only, only in the, the fucking 70s. Yeah. yeah. 
So anyway, we're back at the drive-in, and they hear sirens. And they're like, I hope it's not near. <sighs> but it adds to the suspense still. And Clint you know, Eastwood, yeah, Clint Eastwood was like, the property still oh, so the suspense starts to build, and Clint Eastwood is like, well, I guess there was another alarm. No, Clint Eastwood, or no Thunderbolt. There was just a giant cannon going yeah. off in the middle of town in a place where two years earlier a giant cannon went off in the middle of town blowing up a bank so of course there's going to be 20 cop cars and yeah. Jordan don't you think after a major bank robbery like that the police department might get some more money or they might you know put in more sensors or something oh, yeah. like that I'm sure there's even in the 70s I'm sure there, there's wiring in there that sets things off you know that sets alarm there you could do simple yeah. wiring back then that would set an alarm off I mean that that would be I mean even if they blew it that would probably alert the police yeah. I don't know every fact about this. I didn't look it all up, but yeah, I imagine yeah. they're exactly. They'd be more alert the next time, though. Of yeah. course they would. They're a federal institution still. Yeah. Why am I talking like Hal Holbrook? God. And so, it just embrace your inner Hal Holbrook. Your com- <laughs> embrace inner your inner Hal Holbrook. Uh. <laughs> inner complaining Hal Holbrook. <laughs> just anyway. do it. <laughs> So the sirens are getting closer and the cops actually come to the drive-in. But meanwhile, the the ticket lady and the manager are looking for them. They're still looking for that fucking car that snuck in with that shirt in the back. Snuck in with some people. And coughed, you know, or sneezed or whatever. But but the cops somehow know. And duh, because that I think they must have known that's where the people, you know, the bank robbers hit the first time or something. I don't know. So they go to the drive-in. They're not dumb. And so Clint Eastwood starts to gun it and just starts hitting cars willy-nilly. And they have this old shitty car, so wouldn't you need a better, newer car, a faster car for a bank robbery than some 40s, you know, old But I guess it's real. It's, it's honest. <laughs> I guess. These are broke bank robbers. It makes sense. They did the best they could in the planning for what little they had. They used what they had around them. <laughs> yeah. I guess you're right. Nitpicking, sorry. And then, so Clint Eastwood, I think, is really driving in a lot of these scenes. Oh, yeah. Not, not, yeah. not in the crash scenes and things, but anyway. So they, they escape from the drive-in, but the cops are right behind them, and they shoot. The cops shoot the, the back of the car, and then what happens, Jordan? Um, they're running off and no, no. Are they, a, what, they're running from the car and then what, God, what the hell happens? Um, um, well, it, what happens is that Jeffrey Lewis's character gets shot. Oh, that's right. That's right. That, that's how we Goody. lose him. Oh my God. It gets ugly here. And this is when George Kennedy flips out, right? He changes. Yeah. No. But it's, don't you think it's sad? I was like, Goody, the, the kind of the sweet little, I don't know, sweet guy. He's a bank robber, but I mean, he was yeah. kind of like, you know, he's, gotta, he, he dies and you're we, like, oh man, Goody gets killed. And then Red just opens the trunk and just dumps his body out in the road. It gets ugly here. I mean, this is kind of sad, you know? Yeah, it's sad. And the movie starts to get ugly because then George Kennedy crawls out of the, the trunk and is just like, you know, pulls out his gun and he's like forces Thunderbolt and Lightfoot to get out of the car and he's going to leave with the money and he's panicking, yeah. you know, which is stupid because then he starts driving out on the road where, you know, the cops are going to have barricades, you know, roadblocks everywhere. Right. right. Then what happens? I mean, they're um, Kennedy. You're talking about how Kennedy flips yeah. out and, ki- yeah. and beats the shit out of Jeff, poor Jeff Bridges character. Oh yeah, my God. I mean, kicks him in the, the head. Shit out of him. I mean, kicks him in the head, kicks him in the, well, kicks him in the stomach first a few times and then kicks him in the head. I mean, he goes full on cool hand Luke on his ass. I mean, yeah. big time. And it's ugly. And there might, I mean, it's all, it's so ugly. You almost think he might be dead from this. At first, yeah. At first, when Eastwood walks up in the aftermath when he's yeah. laying there, just kind of laying around. Yeah. So he beats both of them up, and then Red steals the car, and really great uh, car chase sequence, a good little scene through this little Montana town, and the cops, of course, just gun him down, and he crashes into the very uh, department store he was working in earlier, and what happens to him? He gets out of the car, and then what happens? I for, I for, God damn, I forgot. So he escapes. A, I'm sorry. I, no, a Doberman, <laughs> the store Doberman, guard dog. That's right. Yeah. Fucking kills him, and then we see a scene where the dog is dragging his limp, dead body, lifeless body, across the floor. You're like, holy shit, this movie. Oh, that's Damn. right. Oh, my God. My mind blocked it out, I think. It was so traumatic. It's just really weird. It's it, You're like, damn, this movie's sort of lighthearted, and then it has like really bloody moments. It takes on a dark tone here. It's darker. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. So Lightfoot is woozy, and he's still wearing a dress, and he's like, I, I need new clothes, you know? Yeah. But at least they survived. And then George Kennedy died, and so 
they they don't have the money, right? Right. And luckily, just, they, but luckily they escaped at least. But yeah, because yeah. I think Red would have shot them if it weren't for the sirens and the cops. So Red is dead. Red is dead, baby. Red okay. is dead. So we're not going to have Red as the Terminator here coming back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and the next day, uh, Thunderbolt Light, Lightfoot. I almost said Tango and Cash. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. <laughs> Hitching a ride, walking on the street, or walking along the highway again, and they get a ride in the back of a truck. Then Thunderbolt sees something. They get let out at this crossroads, and uh, he's like, "Are you going back to um, what was the town called? Uh, Warsaw? No, no, Warsaw. Not he's Warsaw. like, you yeah. guys, unless you guys are going back to Warsaw, you know, get out here, which is funny, you yeah, know, because yeah. obviously they're not. Um, but they do see something on the side of the road there, Jordan. And what do they see? Is it that other school? The yes. actual school that they're really looking for, that kind of thing? Yeah, it's the actual the school, old the school. old schoolhouse. Okay, yes, yes, this, yes. They see that old school and they enter there and there's tourists inside there. These yeah. Two, this old mom and pop tourists, I guess, are in their 40s or something and they got yeah. a camera and the guy's like, for some reason the guy feels threatened automatically the way they walk in. Yeah, and he's which just is like, really weird. He's really intimidated by them. Mm-hmm. Oh, here's He's my like, camera. Hey, here's my here's my keys. Uh. Yeah. Well, because this thing is like a historic museum sort of thing at a rest stop. Yeah. Like he said, like, oh, we don't want any trouble. Uh. Yeah. I don't I don't really get that. I don't know why that guy's such a, you know, such a wuss. I mean, they just look like two dudes. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. Why did he give in so yeah, yeah, Jeff Bridges' shirt has buttons on it. I don't they don't look that threatening, you know. But anyway, yeah. So they don't even look like hippies. I don't know. They're, I yeah. Know. So then Thunderbolt is very resourceful. He uses his belt buckle to undo the screws that hold the chalkboard on. And he behind does. the chalkboard, like he said earlier in the movie, they find what? A lot of... Is that cash that I saw and two yeah. bags to take it out of there, basically? Isn't that smart, Jordan? Putting bags in there with the money, I just thought that was brilliant. You know, that's really planning ahead. That was nice of them. <laughs> Talk about flying yeah. ahead. Them of two years ago, yeah. <laughs> that was nice of Bill and Ted fashion. That was nice of us, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. So they they get the money, and then Thunderbolt buys a Cadillac, a white Cadillac, which was Lightfoot's dream. And so they get in the, the Boy, it's beautiful. white Cadillac. Yeah. Looks like some Elvis would drive, you know. Yeah, exactly. And Lightfoot is struggling. And then what happens to Lightfoot, Jordan? Oh, God. No, he's slowly... He's laying, he's got these new boots on, it looks like. and But then he's in the seat of the Cadillac. And basically, he's laying over there. And he's, the thing about this performance with Jeff Bridges is this really... Man, why it cuts deep is he slowly looks like he's having a stroke on the side yeah. of his face. For real. Looks yeah. like he's having a stroke. And you're like, oh my God, how hard... You really think as the audience, I'm sorry. And I thought that for a second. Like I was like, how hard did George Kennedy kick him in the head, man? <laughs> how many times did he really kick him? And Oh my God. I almost for a sec believed Jeff Bridges really had been kicked by George Kennedy in this yeah. moment. Because he looks like he's... That's realistic. He looks like he's having a stroke on the side of his face. And yeah, then he slowly keels over. But it's so sad. He, he he gives like Clint Eastwood a cigar. And he's like, I got these cigars. And he's like, yeah. I don't feel like a criminal. I feel like a hero. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's like, That's... I feel like I've done something. We've done something. As he's like stroking out, you're right. And yeah. his face fall- It's brilliant acting, I mean, man. It's yeah. brilliant acting. Eat your fucking heart out, Midnight Cowboy 1969 movie. Yes. I was thinking the exact same thing. That's a better performance than Dustin Hoffman's death scene at yeah. the end of that film. Spoilers. I mean, he's just like, ah, uh, I just peed my pants. Uh. And then he slowly keels over silently, you know, as as he's, hey, you know, you rats, you know what I think I'll do? When we get to Florida, I think I'll get a job or something, a real job, because I ain't no stud. No, but yeah, that's not the same thing. No, this movie really gives it to you, man. Yeah. After all this, just like the 70s, another 70s moment, let's kill off one of the protagonists at the end of the film and have a really nihilistic ending, everybody. Exactly, because somebody's got to die. Most people have to die in the end of a 70s movie. I'm sorry. It's like the 70s always. It's like, it's like I don't know why. It's in the contract or it's in the guild. Maybe it was a guild thing. You know? It was like, yeah. Make sure you kill them off by the end of the movie. <laughs> See, exactly. That's what happened. If they make it to the end of the movie... You know, they get 100% of their salary. Yeah. Salary. 
you know. Was that so, a studio executive decision on so the all execs these movies? Are like, yeah. So the execs are like, you know, if we kill off their character before the end of the movie, then we don't have to pay them yeah. the full amount, you know. I mean, at Warner, you know, Paramount and Fox and UA, did they all have some deal where they'd be like, uh, is the character likable? Answer me. Well, yeah. You mind if they die at the end? I see here that they don't die at the end. <laughs> Well, I guess they can. You know, you got to have them die at the end. You know why? Because then yeah. the audience is going to come back again because they love that character, man. So you let them get, you want to have them die at the end, man. They want to have them die. Let's have a, let's have people. The actors love a death scene. You know that. The actors love a death scene, no matter who they are, no matter what their price. <laughs> yes, we love the film, but we need somebody to die at the end. And, 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 <laughs> and a rape scene. Yeah. How about you have the wife and kid die? We've learned to like them through the whole movie. How about they die in a car accident? <laughs> let's kill off everybody we love in this film. So anyway, you yeah, like Lightfoot. Jeff Bridges? Let's kick him in the head. Let's <laughs> kick him in the head three times. After we kick him in the stomach six, seven times, maybe I didn't. I, I lost count. Yeah, it's sad. It's a, it's a downer ending, but it's but at least it's kind of like he he. I don't know. He was fulfilled and redeemed in sort of a way. I don't know. It's it's touching. My wife really walked is. in after I after when the credits rolled. She was like, "Are you sad?" I was like, "Yeah, this movie made me sad." <laughs> but anyway, the message is crime doesn't pay, and no. then we get that Paul Williams song again, which makes more sense now after That's he's right. dead. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, you made it almost there. <laughs> no, that's the wrong song. I just made that up. <laughs> Jeff Bridges died in the end. He wore that dragon bracefully and boldly. <laughs> but now he's dead in the end. Because in a 70s movie, everybody has to fucking die. God damn it. Why? I love you, 70s, but why? Why does everybody have yeah. to die? <laughs> well... Did audiences, I mean, did this movie die at the box office or did audiences Apparently like not. it? Did you do your research on this? Because I did. Yeah. I have a couple different sources. The movie cost between 2.2 and 4 million. Yes. So maybe high, on the higher end, about 4 that's million. That's close to dollars. what I read, too. 4 million. Yeah. So different. Maybe different. that's prints and advertising included in the 4 million. Yeah. So maybe 2.2 is the actual shooting. Yeah. But it made $25 million. Yes. That's not bad, man. That's, that's not bad. These people loved it. Apparently, <laughs> but apparently, like for for whatever reason, um, I don't have the details. But this really soured Eastwood with United Artists, who who produced the film. Oh, I didn't know United Artists produced the film. I, I thought yeah. Warner maybe was behind it. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. And so, anyways, uh, last film I think they did together. But yeah, so a pretty big hit. But. Uh, that's why there wasn't a sequel. Well, that's not why there wasn't a sequel. Because I guess <laughs> Lightfoot... Now, I didn't look up what critics said back then, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, why wasn't there a sequel? My God, yeah. Like, what happened well, to Jeff Bridges Thunderbolt? is dead. <laughs> yeah, what if, he, what if he got brought back to life in the sequel? You know, in some bionic kind of way. I don't know. What if they call science fiction? Or... <laughs> What if it is like your David Fincher fantasy and Lightfoot was... The whole time, like a figment of his imagination, because oh, yeah. <laughs> he said later on, it turns out that there was another alarm. So Lightfoot was like, "I didn't even have to be in the d distracting um, the the Wells Fargo or the Western Union guy. I didn't even need to do that because there was another alarm anyway that tipped off the cops, right? Yeah, apparently. Yeah. What if he just woke up in a hospital? You know, <laughs> I'm saying Lightfoot woke up in a hospital. <gasps> oh God, I thought I was dead. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, you never saw me die, man, you know? I never really, uh, you no. don't see me die. I know? saw you die. I, I bought that Cadillac, remember? After we got that money out of school. There's the sequel. <laughs> yeah. You saw them. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot return. Would you, but you, so you would like to see a sequel? Fuck yeah, I want to see the sequel to this. So these guys... I want this more than I want a sequel to the Willow movie from 1988. Oh, wait. Fuck, there's a series. Never mind. Which would you... Here's a loaded question. I prefer question. this one, actually. <laughs> Which would you like to see a sequel more for? Harley Davidson, The Marlboro Man, or Thunderbolt and Lightfoot? Oh, you went there. Oh, damn Yeah, you. I went there. Damn you. Tough questions. Okay. We ask the tough questions on this podcast. Today, I will say Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. So, do you think... The, uh, Hopefully, another Paul Williams song on there as well. Do you think this is a, a better pairing than Harley Davidson Marble Man, or is it just too hard to? Oh, absolutely! Different? This is a tighter movie than Harley Davidson. This is a better movie than Harley Davidson Marlboro Man. This is like Oscar level compared to Harley yeah. Davidson the Marlboro Man. I'm sorry, Harley Davidson the Marlboro Man. Sorry, movie. 
Sorry, yeah. that movie. So the the things I like is just I like the the realism and the cinematography is pretty good. It's a couple of weird choppy places and some out of focus stuff, but great use of locations. No, it is it's great. It, I I all of it. I love all of it. Honestly, I really love the movie. I think I think it's a great. It was a great recommendation. Honestly, no joke. Yeah. Eastwood and Bridges, I like their chemistry. What do you think? I totally dig their chemistry, man. It, I mean, they have that buddy cop thing early on in the, it's in the 70s, that b- buddy cop kind of chemistry, you know. They just yeah. they end up together in a situation they meet, you know. <laughs> yeah, and so is there any do you have any criticisms of this film? I mean, it's slow paced in parts like some 70s movies are, but yeah. mo- but it moves at a really good pace and it really it's not like it's a 3-hour movie or a 2 and a half hour movie. It moves at a solid pace because this movie probably played at drive-ins as well, you know, back then, and on 42nd Streets as well. <laughs> oh, I think it was a bigger movie than that. It was a UA movie. I think it played. It oh, absolutely. Played I'm saying, but it probably played in those venues as well. So it's got to be a yeah. good running time, good, decent running times. So they can fit it in everywhere. Yeah. But, Two hours. I agree. I have that in my notes too. The first hour, especially, is really slow. They could have cut. But yeah, it's, it's a, got a solid script by Michael Cimino, clearly, and you can you can see why Clint Eastwood said, "Let him direct." You know, Clint Eastwood had clearly had good in- instincts on this movie, yeah, you know, for the most part. And I mean, yeah, it's it's sl- it's yeah. I mean, we we pick apart a few things on this movie in this review, but honestly, yeah. overall, I will give this. You want to hear my rating? I give this. Yeah, what's your rating? I give this four and a half. S- Scoops of Pistachio by Judy Ann's Ooh. because it's the better one down the street. It's coming in. It's coming from around the corner here soon. And but no, that's what I give it. Four and <laughs> a half scoops of pistachio ice cream by Judy Ann's is what I give this movie. <laughs> Judy Ann's is out of better five. Than... <laughs> out of five scoops, I give it four and a half scoops. <laughs> yeah, I um I I'm giving it an eight out of ten. So yeah, you're giving it like a nine. I'm I'm with you there. It's it's lots of. I fun. liked it that much, honestly. I really yeah, I, and I'm giving it ducks. You can go fuck, kid. <laughs> Damn! Cussing oh, out good. You kids. used it. Uh, how many of them? How many of them did you give it? <laughs> I'm giving it an eight. I'm giving it an eight. So okay, out of eight out of ten. Uh, yeah, go you're fuck like a nine duck. out of ten. <laughs> go suck an egg, Tracy. Go fuck a so, duck, kid. Yeah, it's got a weird jazzy soundtrack at times. It's a little long in the first part, but man, what a fun movie! You, I mean, just great cast. God, what a lot of fun! It's why I love. Honestly, it's like it's why I love seventies movies from the seventies all over yeah. again. You know, every time we yeah. talk about movies from the seventies, it reminds me why I, I like and love certain movies from the seventies, good or bad. Yeah, good or bad, or bad or good, or good and bad, bad good, good bad. This is a very seventies movie, and I really like the, at the, at the end how you get like. They don't get the money, then they get the money. So it's kind yeah. of like yay, yay, and then everybody down loses. Ending. Exactly, everybody <laughs> like, loses. Somebody's got to die out of the two. It's not going to be Eastwood. No, no, no. But Clint Eastwood got the money. I guess it's his movie. So anyway. why could it be? Yeah, why could it be Thunderbolt, the old guy, finally yeah. dying? You know, like I guess that it was more the old days, though. Yeah, that'd be more like you know an old western, more you know. Both these guys are still alive. They're both very old, but they we could we could have a sort of a sequel or a <gasps> remake or something like Dirty Harry and the Dude. Oh my God! You know? Oh yeah, th- yeah. Oh my God! Oh yeah. You you struck gold there. Oh my God! <laughs> Give us a Thunderbolt like I fuck yeah yeah. Why not yeah yeah. Clint, Clint Eastwood's making all these other movies. He, he just wants to remake Thunderbolt Life, and Jeff Bridges is like, I'm not, man, like, I'm not doing anything else, man, you know? Maybe he's I mean, in his head, and he gives him the idea to <laughs> yeah. come out of retirement to rob yeah. something. <laughs> exactly. But to make that happen, we'd have to, Lightfoot would have had to abide it in, instead of dying at the end. Fuck so it, just use the, use, the, uh, use the special effects nowadays, the deep fake stuff, all that, you know, yeah. technology. Yeah. You know, just get younger actors, have them come over, dub the voices, use their use their voices. <laughs> they don't yeah. they don't have to leave a room. They can just stay in a fucking room and do it. You know. Yeah. Have other actors physically do all the work. <laughs> yeah, Jeff Bridges doesn't even have to put down his white Russian. He can you know? look like I mean they can make it they could do that nowadays. They could make it look like, you know they could make well, it they look de-aged like they did him. it in nineteen seventy nine. Exactly. D age 
people. The agent for Tron Legacy, right? Yeah, that was the beginning of that technology. I mean, and now it's beyond that, man. They can, yeah. they can go beyond that. I, yeah, AI is going to put us out of business, Jordan. It's going to be it's eventually put just this whole podcasting thing out of business. People won't listen anymore. <laughs> Programs about guys talking about movies and just make unnecessarily obscure references. No, they'll take things we say on podcasts and they'll generate pictures from it. <laughs> Maybe AI will pick a movie that people would uh, have actually heard of. But anyway, all right, everyone, thank you all for listening, especially our new listeners. Check out our other episodes if you like this. And Jordan, it's been great talking to you about movies. Great talking to you. Great recommendation. Great talking to you, man. I, I love this movie, Thunderbolt and Lifer from 1974. Yeah, and next time maybe we'll have a movie where freaking the protagonist that you like so much doesn't die at the end. Yeah, and maybe where somebody doesn't say, Hey, kid, go fuck a dog. Good dog. Yeah. But God, you gotta love George Kennedy. Only George Kennedy could get away God with that. God bless George Kennedy. God bless that man. Sir George Kennedy, you're sir acting George sir. Kennedy. We remember you, sir, as we think of you this night. Yeah. All right, everyone, thanks for listening again. And Jordan, this has been... The Robots Took My Podcast, man. <laughs> go fuck a duck, kid. All trailers, clips, music, or any other copyrighted material are used sparingly, edited from their original forms, and used for the purposes of criticism, discussion, commentary, and education about these fine films.